And can you open up with us to 1 Peter chapter 3? That's where we're going to be. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're working through our series. Uh, I, I love you having the, it's up behind me, but that's for those without a Bible. I like you having it in front of you so that you can check what's being preached, see that it's all right, and uh, object later, and uh, come and talk to me if, if, if at all of this uh, uh, is not in agreement with, with how you read Scripture. But uh, we've been going through the series of First Peter, and it's been, it's been a wild ride. Today is an especially curly, interesting, strange, unpopular text that I wouldn't have picked if we weren't going through the book step by step. So that's why we do that. It's good for us. Uh, tonight, we, we have our, uh, I'm just uh, reminding, as, as Vic said, we, had, we have our series that we're going through, the church series, uh, probably about 12, 13 more weeks where we're breaking down, what does the Bible say the church is? What is the New Testament church? How should we relate to it? What's our responsibilities in it? And how can we tell what a good and healthy church is? Is anything a church because it says it's a church? Uh, What are the responsibilities of the elders in the church? It's all so important for us living in this age of the church before Jesus comes back. So we're going through that, breaking it down, and tonight we're going to be looking at what the invisible church is. The nature of this universal church all over the world that is invisible, and next week we look at the visible church. So I hope you're keen for that. I trust now you're in 1 Peter chapter 3, right there, and we're going to be in verse 18 through to verse 22. Uh, As we've been going through 1 Peter, we're learning this. We're learning that as a main thesis, Peter is saying that as we behold Christ and his sufferings and the glories they produced, we will be able to suffer rightly as Jesus did. As we behold Jesus' sufferings and what they produced, we will be able to also suffer with him. That's been, that's been the main message of 1 Peter all the way through. And so we started looking at the glories of Christ, or as chapter 1 verse 11 says, the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. That's one of the main themes. And so Peter's been looking at all of the suffering of Christ in order to encourage us in our suffering. And then he looks at the glories of Christ that came after that, in order to encourage us that there is something coming for us, a living hope given to us by Jesus. Because remember, 1 Peter is the letter written to the Christians in churches like ours, but in a time much unlike ours, back in 56, 55 AD. I'm lying to you. 64, 65 AD. Went a bit dyslexic there for a moment. And in the 60s, Nero, the emperor over Rome, started his crackdown on Christianity. He he burned Rome, blamed the Christians, and then started burning Christians, hunting them down, taking them out of their homes, pinning them to crosses, burning them, calling them the Roman candles. This is what Nero was doing. But just before that hits, Peter writes his two letters. And he's telling that the, 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 the atmosphere against Christianity is growing. And so he's writing, in a world that is against Christians, The more you live like Jesus, the more you'll suffer. Here's how you should live. Look at Jesus, be encouraged by his example, and suffer with him and like him. And so he tells us, of course, that Jesus was that lamb who was killed. He was that stone that was rejected by men. He is like the criminal being treated terribly and dying unjustly. They're the sufferings of Christ. But then he also, on the backside of that, talks about the glories that came from it. Of course he was the slaughtered lamb, but he was bringing atonement for a sin-sunken world. Of course he he was rejected as a stone, put away from the builders, but that stone became the foundation stone for the whole temple that is the church. And yes, he died as a criminal, but he died in order to make unrighteous people righteous before God. This has been the theme so far in 1 Peter. If you haven't watched any of the sermons, been able to devour those from prior, I encourage you to jump on our YouTube or our Facebook and you can see all of them, get all of the context. It's all one big message throughout 1 Peter. So today's message, today's message brings, uh, today's verse, sorry, brings us to this reality that Peter's now going to tell us that the victorious Christ, through his sufferings, is doing something continually through us as we suffer. So we're going to see the victory of Christ through his persecution and our victory in Christ through our persecution. And what we're going to see is is that as is with Christ is also with us, the greater the sacrifice, the greater the suffering, means the greater the benefit. 
the greater the reward and the result. And of course, so we, we should just be taking from the very get-go this, this application to our own life that we don't move towards comfort. We don't try and live a life that is as cushioned as possible and expect some kind of great reward in heaven or, or great fruit for the gospel here on earth. But we, like Jesus, move towards sacrifice, move towards the need where, where it hurts in order to serve others, and then we expect and we receive the reward. That we move towards the greater obedience and holiness, not comfort and cozy Christianity. We move towards the sacrifice for our local church, not drawing back from responsibilities. We, we receive and walk towards the greater persecution as you evangelize the lost souls around you, not, not seeking to take the least persecuted route to heaven. And this means that we have the greater zeal for the worldwide mission of God in and among the nations, even at the cost of your life moving away from self-preservation at the cost of the nations. This is our mind if we have the mind of Christ because we see that the greater the persecution, the greater the suffering, the greater the reward. So let's read the text this morning and I want you to see that the victory of Christ in his suffering and our victory through our suffering. Verse 18, the word of the Lord reads like this. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. This is the word of God, inerrant and infallible to us this morning. Amen? I wonder if you saw my thesis there. Did you see, as you read that really straightforward passage, right? Preacher's dream. God, Jesus going to preach to spirits in prison from Noah's day and all of that. Something about the resurrection. Our, our, our expository application today is that, through, that, that the victory of Christ through his persecution and seeing our victory through Christ in our persecution, seeing those things enables us to suffer well. That enables us to be persecuted with joy, like James tells us, with a smile, if we may, knowing these. How can I suffer well and be persecuted well? By seeing the victory of Christ through his persecution and knowing the victory that I have in Christ through my persecution. So we're going to see that as we suffer, as we are persecuted, number one, Jesus suffers with us. Number two, Jesus preaches through us. And number three, Jesus vindicates us. He suffers with us, he preaches through us, and he vindicates us. The, the victorious Christ suffers with us, preaches through us, and vindicates us on a cosmic scale to the whole universe, vindicating us though we suffer. So we'll go straight into it. Look at, look at verse 18. Before that is verse 12 through to 17, which has been a plea from Peter, as he's been saying throughout the book, to live righteously. That being persecuted, pushed down, oppressed by the government, or he gives the example in your workplace or even at home from your spouse, none of these things, in fact, he even gives a bit of a touch, even from other Christians, you being mistreated is never an excuse to play the victim and then have an excuse to sin or live less righteously, or retaliate, or, or live in sin a little bit because, you know, I'm suffering over in this portion of my life. God will understand it's all a big scale. The more I suffer, the more excuse I have to live in the flesh. Now, Peter's saying, whatever you do, wherever you are, no matter what the pressure coming against you, your responsibility is not to control the world and governments and how much they persecute, or control other people and, and defend yourself against uh, uh, slanderous remarks and things like that. Your responsibility 
is to live righteously before God. Keep your conscience between you and the Lord spotless, walking in repentance. And in that way, regardless of whether you suffer, God is behind you, with you, his eyes upon you, his ear towards you in prayer. That's what we learn through verse 12 to 14. And and then Peter simply says, you'll see it in verse 17, therefore, it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So, So suffering, persecution is never a sign of God's displeasure with you. It may be that he's teaching you repentance of certain sins, and it may be that he's bringing something into your life that will lead you to repentance, but simply a a, a bad situation is not a sign that God's unpleased with you. In fact, it may be the very sign that he loves you. His, His most beloved son, perfect son, Jesus, went through the worst suffering imaginable. So suffering is not a sign of God's displeasure, but rather we we pursue righteousness, expect persecution, and, and if ever. If ever we have this mindset that we say, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I live righteously, I walk in obedience, and I suffer, should I? Don't I get to claim that I'm a son of the Lord? Don't, don't I get to claim that, that, that I'm, uh, I'm royal? I'm, I'm a priest, as Peter said. I have the glorious gospel of all the ages poured into my spirit. Do I need to suffer? How much? Is, is there a limit? That's pride rising up. We, 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 we hear the call, okay, suffer, but, but we not want to put in some kind of stop to say, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't suffer too much. There's something about me, right? That there's some value I have that would keep me from suffering terribly. And then verse 18 comes in. You suffer for righteousness because Christ suffered. Even Christ suffered once the righteous for the unrighteous. This is the encouragement from Peter. In fact... I'll take that back. This is the command from Peter. Stop using persecution as an excuse for sin. Live righteously, suffer well, and take joy in it, for Christ also suffered. So let's look at some some ways that the suffering of Christ is similar to ours, because this is Peter's point. He's trying to encourage you, you today. Through Peter, by the Spirit, by my words, God is encouraging you wherever you are in your life, whatever persecution you're receiving, Peter's encouragement is Christ suffered in a way that is much like you. Here's how. Number one, Christ suffered unjustly. All of the assaults against his person, all of the the, the slanderous things brought against him, none of them were true. None of them were true. He suffered unjustly. He he never deserved to go through what he went through. And and that can be similar to you. Sharing the gospel, standing up for righteousness, looking up, uh, looking after uh, those people in need or who who need it, or or even raising your voice up for the, the slaughtered unborn in abortion. Any of those examples, you get attacked for that. You get persecuted. You don't deserve that. And and Peter says, Well, neither did Jesus. He suffered unjustly. He also suffered at the hand of sinners, evil people. Just like Peter was talking to a church who was suffering through the evil regime of Nero. You know, Proverbs even says, let let a righteous man strike me. That's a blessing. I'm okay to go through suffering or persecution or or rebuke if it's from a righteous guy, but I don't want some sinner coming and, and bringing his attack against me. But Jesus did. He had unrighteous men bring the accusations against him. He also lived righteously like we're called to do. He suffered in this way, in all these ways that are similar to us, at the hand of sinners, when he didn't deserve it, when he lived righteously. He did all of that to be able to sympathize with us, as Hebrews 4 tells us. We don't have a high priest in heaven, disconnected from us, unknowing what it's like to be going through the sin-sunken world. He sympathizes with us. He suffered everything we suffered and worse, and never gave in to sin. That's our Jesus. He empathizes, sympathizes, knows what we have gone through. He lived in the flesh like we just heard from the creed, a real, true human, suffering real, true, human, suffering. So when we go through suffering, persecution, we never think we're above this. We never think that we don't deserve it, so we should push back from it. 
I know what this guy's like. I'm not going to get spoken to like that from him. No, when we are persecuted, whether from government, friend, neighbor, spouse, work colleague, boss, we simply say, of course this happens to me. Look what they did to Jesus. Of course I'm persecuted. I follow the persecuted, killed, slaughtered, unrighteously murdered Jesus Christ. I'm not above him. Servant's not above his master. This is my glory. But there are ways, and and this is the even more encouraging way. There are ways that we can never suffer like Jesus. There are so many ways about the, uh, the death of Jesus. There's so many ways that it's, it's unrepeatable. It's unlike us. So look at verse 18. Even though there's all of those similarities that give us hope and, and joy and, and, and a relationship with Christ to be able to say, yeah, I, I'm walking like Jesus did. Yet verse 18 shows us the more glorious things are the things that we can't relate to. Christ suffered once. The death of Christ, as you'll get if you ever go through the book of Hebrews, the death of Christ is a one-time, unrepeatable event. We don't need to come in at any other time and give any other offering in order to pay for our sins. It happened once. It happened finally, completely, satisfying God totally. We don't need to repeat it. That gives joy to every person who knows, I can't bring anything to satisfy God for my sin. Even after becoming a Christian, I can see my guilt. What do I bring now? Jesus paid for all my past sins. Now there's more. Is there another sacrifice? No, we look back to the cross and say that one time death for all time, for all sinners, for every sin is mine even today and I'm washed clean by his blood as we just sung. Is that not the the grounds for assurance in the Christian life as you suffer and sin and fail and come back again to church to take communion and hear the word knowing you're such a failure, but Jesus, he died once. It's done. It's done. He died, he suffered once for sins. There's a sense that when we suffer, we're suffering because of other people's sin. They're attacking us. They're maligning us. They're coming against it. That's sinful. I'm, I'm suffering for their sin. But there's a sense that, that we don't suffer for their sin in a way to pay for their sin. Jesus did that. Jesus died in a way that we never have other people's sin imputed to us and then we satisfy God for it. Jesus did. He didn't just suffer at the hand of sinners. He was suffering for the very sins they were committing against him in that moment. Jesus suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. We, are ne- we can never be spoken about in a true, definitive, pure sense as the righteous. Of course, Scripture will over and over again command us to be righteous, and Psalm will, will pray, even the Psalm that we read this morning, the, the righteous ones, right? we who relate to God as his people, we have a right to call ourselves, if we're walking in his way, the righteous ones. People are persecuting the righteous ones. But we know that's that's a very conditioned statement because underneath the hood, you can find hundreds of examples in the last 40 minutes that I am not righteous, unrighteous, guilty, sinful. But Jesus never had... It wasn't just that Jesus was the most righteous guy in Israel. He was perfectly, purely, completely righteous. This is where we get our doctrine of the imputation of sin. The doctrine of imputation is basically just the doctrine of the gospel. Hold it tightly. Set it in your mind as a ground, foundational, basic doctrine that everything is built on. Imputation is the, is the doctrine that our sins were reckoned to Christ's account. They were transferred into his legal account before God. As if God picked them up. Sin isn't a physical mass, but God picked them up from our account and placed them onto Christ's shoulders. And what's more is that God then picked the righteousness of Christ up and lays it on our shoulders so that he who was righteous was given and died as a sinner. God related to him as a sinner and all of our sins were paid for in somebody else. And we stand before God, perfect, pure, righteous, deserving of heaven. As long as we have faith in Christ, we have all of his righteousness and all that it deserves. He died the righteous 
for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God. He didn't just die. Friends, he didn't just die so that you could have an example of love. He didn't just die so that you can feel guilty about your sin because that's how much God hates sin. He didn't even just die so that you could be forgiven. He didn't die so that you could be forgiven of your sins, friends. He died so that being forgiven, justified, you could be adopted into his family and brought near to God, sitting at his table, underneath his wing, as his child. Jesus died to bring us into the presence and the communion of God. And so whether you're a Christian this morning or not, this same good news comes to us. If you're a Christian, Jesus died to bring you to God. He's not satisfied. I am here preaching to you, unsatisfied if you believe that you're forgiven by God and feel really guilty for your sins, even those you committed last night, and so you'll sort of just stay at the door. The rest of the children of God can go in, enjoy the blessings and the glory and the gospel of God, and I'm, I'm going to stay out here. I don't deserve to go in there, to, to, to take of God's grace like they do. Friends, Jesus died to bring you to God. The devil wins a victory if we stay back from our relationship with God with lack of assurance because of the guilt of our sin. Take that guilt, throw it at the foot of the cross, run to the throne of grace and receive more grace. That's why it's called the throne of grace. You're a sinner, that's the place for you. You keep stuffing up after becoming a Christian, that's the place for you. Come in, God has sent his son to bring you near to him, not at arm's length out at the doorway, away from his grace. And of course, if you're a sinner this morning, maybe you're offended at that kind of title. You, a sinner, not a Christian. Outside of Christ, you have no righteousness. Outside of Christ, you don't have anyone that can take your sins, die for you. You need Jesus Christ. And the call of God is for you. He died for the unrighteous. Are you unrighteous? Are you perfect? I'll, I'll answer that. The answer is no. You're unrighteous, filthy in sin, and maybe you feel the guilt of all of your treachery against God. For you, Christ was given to bring even you to God. Peter encourages them with this. Of course, Jesus suffers in ways that that we repeat and we, in ways like we suffer, but he also suffered in ways that we can never repeat because he achieved for us salvation. Jesus suffers with us. Jesus suffers with you when you're persecuted. That's that's point number one, verse 18. I want to show you then, though, verse 19 through to 20, the the, the more, the the stranger of of the verse here, but but I'll show you the the clear message that Peter is is giving to us. So look now at verse 19. Sorry, end of verse 18 through, through 19. It says, of course, he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. He doesn't mean that his body was dead, but his spirit was alive. He means very similar to 1 Corinthians 15, when it says that this body is sown, and the flesh is sown to the ground, and the spiritual raises up. The resurrection body we get is a spiritual, physical body, but it's, it's talked about in spiritual terms. It's, it's that in the realm of which is eternal, not perishable. So it's physical, but it's spiritual. So he says, he was put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. Here's what's happening. Recall recall verse 15, when we were told that as we suffer, we should be giving a testimony to the hope that we have. We should be using every moment of persecution that we're pressed to give answers or or teased for what we believe. We should use that as an opportunity to preach Christ, the, the hope that we have. And the encouragement here is that Jesus did preaching as well. There's a couple of... Uh, No, there's not a couple. There's an unending number of ways to view this passage. There's four main ones that are most popular. Two of them are compromised on pretty important doctrines anyway. So we have two ending, uh, two final uh, views of this passage that is even worth considering. One of them is that when it says Christ in the spirit went and preached to spirits in prison, 
who were formerly disobeying God in the, in the time of Noah. What that view is, is that as we read back in Genesis 6 and, and Jude and 2 Peter, in the days of Noah, as, as the angels in heaven, right, there's been one fall, the fall that went with Satan and took one third of his angels, who, who've become the demons and the spiritual forces of darkness in this world. That was fall number one. But angelic fall number two was when, in the days of Noah and, and the generations before him, The angels from heaven saw the beauty of the daughters of men, these human daughters, and they left their proper place of service to God and with lust in their hearts came down, assumed human bodies, and begun to sleep with the women of men, creating this this angelic, demonic, human hybrid, which Genesis 6 calls the Nephilim those who became mighty and powerful and strong. And, and, and I, I don't have time to go into it all today, but, but at risk of those men, those, those unsavable men, Jesus did not die. God never planned to save and he never elected those who are half demon, half man. He died to save men. He didn't become a demon man God. He became a God man. There would never be any sacrifice for them. And and so if they grew and continued to populate the earth and wipe out the godly line or the human line, there would be no way of salvation. So I wonder if you've seen it this way. In order to save the world, God drowned the world. In order to be able to have a human line that would produce Jesus to die for humans, God had to wipe out that, that polluted, angelic, demonic line of the Nephilim. And so God did that. He sent the flood. He, 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 he killed all on the earth except for eight. Noah and his family were in the ark and those spirits, those spirits who had come down from heaven and mingled with the daughters of men were thrown into a dark and gloomy prison until the day of judgment. And all of their progeny, the Nephilim, these demonic man beings, these beasts, their souls also unsavable were cast into that gloomy place of darkness until the day of judgment. Strange stories we find in the Bible, but Peter uses them as a teaching point. Now, one view is that Peter is talking about that. And he's saying those those spirits who have gone into prison, when Jesus died, or maybe just after his resurrection in, in some way, at some point before he went up to the throne in glory, he went down into that gloomy place of darkness and proclaimed his victory saying, you left heaven and came and became one of like the men, and you condemned them, you condemned yourself, and you thought you would wipe out God's line. I'm here, I left heaven, I've come not to destroy the race, but save the race, and you, your judgment is sure. We went back up to heaven, leaving them to wallow in their misery. Maybe, that, that, that's one view. Uh, now, I don't see how that fits the context. I, I don't, that, of course, in, in the English text, that seems really straightforward from the, from the reading. But as we break it down into and, and study what, what these phrases are meaning in the Greek and how else they're used in the New Testament, it, it's not, a, con, it's not a, a textually convincing argument, but it's also not a contextually convincing argument. Well, why is Peter using that example? What would he be saying? You, as you're persecuted, preach the gospel. Because, like Jesus, one day after they're dead, you might get to preach in their face and remind them of their condemnation and then go and enjoy heaven. That's why you should preach the gospel. Is that his encouragement? That doesn't seem to be the contextual flow as if, as if Peter is encouraging us to, to make good of the gospel, preach it in, our, in, in those moments of suffering and persecution. That, that doesn't seem to be the, the message he's, he's giving. He's saying, he, this is in the context of, Jesus suffers, persecuted, to bring people to God. You also suffer to make fun of them when they're damned. The application is at least weak. But what, rather what I think is happening, and it takes a bit more uh, uh, textual work, but it's saying this, that, and, and I'm not one to... to, to Walk away from the strange application. I love them. I, I'm not walking away from that because it's, it's too spiritual or weird. I believe right now there's half man, half demon spirits in a gloomy prison somewhere. I'm, I'm not afraid of that. But I think Peter's encouragement is different. Here's what I think he's saying. Walk through verse 19 with me. In 
in which he went, so in the spiritual resurrection, he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. Here's the, the, more, uh, the, the view that, that I hold to, that, that most of the, the commentators who hold to a reformed position will also hold to. What it's saying is that Christ, raised into the spiritual realm, did something else in that spiritual realm. Not the non-physical realm, but that spiritual, eternal, everlasting, imperishable realm. In that reality, he's done something else. Back in the days of Noah, as 2 Peter 2 tells us, Noah was preaching the gospel of, of whatever he understood then, the good news at least, the herald that he was giving was, turn from your sin, walk away from the treachery against our creator God, come to the ark, judgment is coming, help me build it, be safe in it, the deluge will destroy you if you don't. That's what Peter was proclaiming, he was a herald of righteousness. And what we're being told is that Christ, who was raised into the spiritual realm, as we one day will be, he's done something else in that spiritual realm. Way back when Noah was preaching to disobedient souls who are currently in prison, but back then were in the bodies of men walking around, Jesus was preaching through Noah to the disobedient souls. That in the spiritual realm, when the Holy Spirit was, was talking through Noah to preach, it was Jesus preaching through Noah in the time of persecution. And then he vindicated him, as we see, by saving him. And this is where we're so similar with him. That we, persecuted by the whole world, even if there was only eight Christians who got saved like it was in Noah's day, Peter's encouragement is Jesus came by his Holy Spirit and preached to sinners through Noah and only eight got saved, Jesus will also now be coming down and preaching through us amid our persecution to sinners. That's glorious. And I'll show you from the text. Because you don't believe me. I can see it in your face. You liked, you liked the Nephilim story. It's way cooler. Well, well, let me show you this. First, it says that he proclaimed, right? In which, right? In that resurrection power, in which he went and proclaimed. That word proclaimed is, is the word kariso in the Greek. Uh, it, it's, me, it's the word that, was, that, that really means a, a hopeful, expectant preaching of good news. It's, what you, it's what's used of Jesus in the Gospels, the apostles through the book of Acts, John the Baptist in the Gospels. It's, it's the preaching of good news, which is unlikely or at least would need some kind of explanatory condition if Peter's saying Jesus preached condemnation to the demons the fallen angels. It would be an inappropriate word at least. Uh, there would need to be some kind of, he preached condemnation, but he doesn't. He simply says preached, which has a positive idea about it in the way that it's used in the scriptures. And when it says he preached, he proclaimed to spirits, that word spirit can mean either, you know, maybe we hear the word spirits and think, well, obviously that's, that's the angelic, but it can be used of either human souls or angelic spirits, fallen or otherwise in prison, the spirits in prison. Not that they are now, sorry, not that they were in prison when the preaching happened, but they are now in prison who were formerly free. So we could read it as, and, and the Greek is ambiguous on this one, it could be read, he went and proclaimed to the spirits who are now in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. There, there again is that, is that phrase like we hear in 2 Peter, God's patience waits for repentance expectantly. God can't wait for the repentance of spirits. They don't repent. God doesn't give them a repentant heart. They can't be saved. There's no atonement for them. So conclusively, I think, broken down, we see that he went in his resurrection spiritual power way back then before he had come in the flesh. He went through Noah and preached to the spirits now in prison because they formally didn't obey when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. That's what I think is his point. And, and here's, this, is, this happens even back in chapter 1. You remember when he's talking about the prophets? And he says the spirit of Christ was prophesying about the, coming, the, the sufferings of Christ and the consequent glory. Peter's already said this, this idea that Christ was prophesying in the Old Testament. Now he's saying again, Christ preached through Noah and also Christ will preach through us. 
That's his point here. So, this gives weight to the gospel preached, doesn't it? It gives weight to the gospel rejected. It gives weight to what you're doing when you go into the world, hand out gospel tracts, speak to your neighbor, your cousin, maybe your spouse, your boss. You stand on the street corner and you herald the good news. You go to another country and, and preach the gospel. It's not simply you as a foot soldier out there while Jesus is on the throne somewhere else. Your king hoping you're doing a good job. Friends, as you and I speak of Christ, Christ speaks through us. It's not our power. It's not our word. It's not our convincing arguments. It's the spiritual power that Jesus brings to us by his Holy Spirit. As much as we speak the truth of Christ, Christ is speaking that truth through us. We can say every time you've shared the gospel, every time you've preached the truth to somebody, we can say in that moment, as Peter says of Noah, Christ went and preached to your neighbors. Christ went and preached at your family Christmas. Christ went and preached in the mission field through you as a herald of the gospel. And to reject that is not simply to reject human, unimpressive speakers. It is to reject and oppose the eternal Son of glory who is there spiritually speaking to them. That's Peter's, that's Peter's point of using this story. When Christ preached through Noah, he will also do in that way the preaching through you. And it's so similar, our, our situation with, with Noah, and we'll look at that in a little bit of, of how we get, uh, uh, how, how we, we see the similarities and are encouraged through that. But the message of Peter is so much better than, than simply knowing that we preach God's word. To know in our hearts that he is preaching through us, whether we're suffering under government, husband, boss, whether we're being hunted alive by Nero, Christ comes alongside, suffers with you, and preaches through you. Glorious. Thirdly, let's look at from verse 21 through to verse 22. This is where we see that as you suffer, Christ suffers with you. As you preach, Christ is preaching through you. And lastly, Christ will vindicate you so that you don't just die as the unvindicated sufferer who preached. Just like Noah. Just like Noah, there is a vindication for you. Look at this. What was Noah's vindication? And by vindication, I mean God coming in and proving you correct and heralding to the world that you were right. God was with you on your side. That's what I mean by vindication. God vindicated Noah in verse 20 while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. That, that's Noah's vindication. As the sinful man who rejected Noah, mocked Noah, made fun of Noah, called him an old idiot building some ark for a rain that's never going to come. What was Noah's vindication? They were sinking. He was floating. He doesn't need to make any remark. He won that one. That he's very clearly vindicated. As the rain started falling and the door closed heavy on the ark, everybody knows that Noah was right. Everybody re 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 regrets the, the, the response that they gave to Noah. This guy was right. It's true. There is a flood coming. We should have listened. In our world, in our time, What's our vindication? Of course, you might want to look into the future and say, well, the vindication is Jesus will come back, throw everybody in hell, we'll go to heaven. In one sense, that's true. But really, the vindication that Peter looks to, that we have right now, that you can say, as surely as Noah could, standing on top of the ark, I told you, God is pouring out his judgment and he gives salvation to all who believe and I am here as a testimony. We do the same thing as we talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's our vindication. That as we proclaim the resurrection, assured that God raised back his son from death, that's us giving testimony to the world and God testi testifying to the world, I am going to judge the world. These preachers are correct. Never has anyone disproved 
or, or, or come over victorious over the argument of the resurrection. It doesn't happen. He, he, he ends with this over in verse 22. He's gone into heaven and sits at the right hand. And at the end of verse 21, we have this through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's our vindication. And of course, the baptism is, is, re- is, is referenced there. Verse 21. Noah was saved through water. That's his vindication. Verse 21, baptism now corresponds to this, which saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ. What was the physical sign that people could look to and say, Noah is preaching something? They could look to the physical wooden ark and say, that's what he is preaching. I see with my eyes what I hear with my ears. And baptism is the same for us. A physical sign that represents a spiritual reality that we enter into as a show, as a testimony of the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. I too will rise with him. Governor Nero, you kill me, I'll rise again. Jesus rose again. Persecuted Christians around the world in our city, as we are attacked, we can say to them, the resurrected Jesus assures you, assures you, I will rise again. Come and enter the ark of Christ. Run from the deluge of wrath that is coming for all who reject Christ. That is what Peter is saying. We're vindicated through this testimony given of baptism, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here's the the last point of it, the last part of it, that he really nails this home. He says, of course, the resurrection is enough, but more, verse 22. He has gone into heaven at the right hand of God, and angels, authorities, and powers have been subjected to him. Nero, demons, false prophets, the persecuting world, every single one of them, they attack us, and we see past them and know that they are simply behaving as commanded by our God. Jesus is on the throne. People persecute, attack us, only in as much as Jesus has ordained them to do so for our good, for the spread of his gospel. Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is there. Nothing touches us without his allowing it to do so. That's a vindication for us that no authority is higher than the one we follow regardless of how much we suffer. So this morning, I want to I say that through me, through this sermon, through the word preached, don't be like those rebellious in Noah's day, standing off, rejecting, mocking. You may think Christians have, have no, no real hard evident proof. Right? You think that, that you'll both die and, and, and you had the better arguments in life than they did, and here they are meeting in church. Where's your God, Christians? But just as much as Noah's day learned soon enough that Noah was right, you will face the truth soon enough. And surely, Jesus is real. He did die for sinners. He does call you today. You may mock us like Noah, but God brings his justice. Join us in the ark of Christ. Run to him. Leave your sin behind. Be saved. God has set a day. He is waiting patiently now as he did in that day. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent because there's a day set of judgment that is coming on every soul with no second chances. He has given you ample proof of this by raising Jesus Christ from the dead and setting him on the throne. The door is still open. Come before God shuts it and brings the judgment of his deluge. Can you bow your heads with me as I pray over us? Jesus Christ, we thank you that you are the resurrected, reigning, exalted, glorified Jesus, the Lord, the King over all things. We thank you that you have given to us to walk into that throne room, sit at the foot of your throne, receive a cross to carry, and become more and more like you as we live in this life persecuted. And though like Noah, we receive no exaltation in this life from the world, we receive it from you, God. That is enough for us. 
And we look forward to the day of receiving our full reward in heaven. Put eternity on our hearts, God, so that we don't live with the the pleasures of the flesh and the sins of this world in our heart, but striving for the eternal world to come after the flood. That world on our heart. Save souls this morning, God. Make us holy. Give us joy. Thank you for the cross, Jesus. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.